So then, from IOC, IOD, we go to, to OBIS, the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. I will start my uh, presentation with this slide to give you an idea of the extent uh, of OBIS. So at the moment, we have 45 million uh, observations, and we are adding about 2 to 3 million per year, about 100 of 114,000 marine species. We, at the moment, we've, we have integrated 1,900 databases, and we have 500 institutions providing data in 56 countries. And so far, a bit more than 1,000 papers have cited OBIS, and some of them are really high-impact uh, journal papers. And we're adding about 10 papers per month at the moment. OBIS it all started during the Census of Marine Life, which was a 10-year program uh, funded by the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation in the US. Uh, and OBIS was recognized as the data repository information component of the Census of Marine Life. Uh, it was a real big program. Uh, they say, well, Sloan Foundation uh, gave 65 million US dollars to that program, but they say that, that was actually 10% of the entire budget because so many institutions, so many countries joined uh, the Sense of Marine Life. So, but uh, the Sloan Foundation, they really said in the beginning, we want OBIS to be the legacy of the Sense of Marine Life. But we cannot. We can only fund it for ten years. So after ten years, uh, you'll need to find a new home. So then, in two thousand and nine, at the twenty fifth session of the IUC assembly, the member states uh, adopted OBIS as being part of uh, I of IUC and as a project of IUDE. And that was mainly because of three points. Because they they all agreed that the knowledge of oceans biodiversity is so so important for national and global environmental issues, that the responsibility for the OBIS continued success should be assumed by governments. And it was not new. Uh, IUC was very strong in physical uh, climate and chemical data, but they, there was a, a gap in biology. So they required ocean biogeographic data to be added. And uh, of course, IUC didn't need to start from scratch. You, uh, they could adopt. They, there was the opportunity to uh, adopt OBIS as an existing global network uh, and associated research community. So that actually also changed a bit the, the mission of OBIS because in the sense of marine life, it was really a purely scientific mission trying to describe what lived where lives and will live in the ocean, really mapping uh, the biodiversity in the ocean. So now it's, we have, uh, and that's an important change, uh, a mandate under the under UNESCO IUC to contribute to the protection of marine ecosystems by assisting identifying marine biodiversity hotspots and large-scale ecological patterns in all ocean basins. And one of the objectives of setting that baseline for marine biodiversity assessment and monitoring and OBIS is not just a database, it's really a global alliance. It's a network of hundreds of marine institutions that work together, uh, data managers working together with scientists uh, to facilitate free and open access to data, to, to provide application of data and information on marine life. Uh, and also recently uh, at the UN General Assembly, uh, OBIS, they, they appreciated and recognized OBIS contribution to marine scientific research. So in terms of governance structure, so IUD is the program that we are uh, run under. So IUD uh, prog uh, programs in IUC can establish projects. And a, a steering group is meant to um, uh, steer uh, projects in IUD. So IUD in 2011 established the OBIS project and the steering group. The steering group is composed of all the node managers. And we also have established uh, task teams. So we have a science advisory task team, a taxonomy task team, a training task team, a data task team, and technical task team. Members of the task teams don't necessarily need to be part of the OBIS nodes. They can have, we can invite external experts to these task teams. We have three tier structure of OBIS nodes. So the central uh, international OBIS node is tier one. We have tier two OBIS nodes, and we have tier three OBIS nodes. The tier two OBIS nodes have a bit more uh, 
responsibility in terms of quality control. Uh, all the quality, the, the, data, the quality of the data should be really up to standards. And they also have a, a mentory role for tier three nodes. So new nodes often come in as a tier three and have uh, a parent tier two to, 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 to give to assist, to assist them. After some time, they can become a tier two. So the steering group meeting, we meet every year. So we discuss the activities, we discuss, we discuss practices, best practices, and we propose recommendations and build a work plan. That work plan is then proposed to the uh, IOD uh, committee meeting. They approve the work plan. Then the IOD makes the recommendations of the work plan to the IOC assembly. So then as the countries who agree on the work plan and, and, and uh, divide the budget that they have received from the UNESCO General Conference. So it's IOC assembly, the 147 member states that come together, discuss the program of, of, of all the projects and programs and activities. But it's actually at the UNESCO General Conference, which is other member states, other representatives who decide on the budget. So it's a rather complex uh, structure. Um, but that's how it works when you are part of a uh, uh, United Nations body. So on system architecture, uh, as I said, we have 500 data providers at the moment. Oh. They are in turn harvested or uh, the data are integrated by national, re regional or thematic OBIS nodes. Thematic nodes can be global uh, in, in, in scope. Um, so the OBIS nodes, they uh, receive the data. They can be in, in Excel sheets, they can be in IPT, uh, in whatever formats. They do all the processing, the quality control. And then every three months, we harvest the OBIS nodes. We do the integration and do a, num a few uh, Q QC steps as well. And do the indexing. Uh, so that's a cycle of, at the moment, every three months. And then we publish a new version of the database and make them available through the web portal, which is the moment through the web, through the mapper. And we create a number of products and maps and statistics. You can access data, of course, through the mapper. Uh, and then you can download the data. There's also a number of uh, OGC uh, web services. And you can actually uh, access the SQL database directly. Those things you will learn during this week. In terms of growth of data, there's really no uh, decline in the numbers, number of records that are added uh, to OBIS. So you can see after the end of the Sense of Marine Life, we had about 28 million records, about 800 data sets. But to keep the, the growth steady, so now we have 45 million records, uh, actually, we have added 1,100 data sets. So the data sets are getting smaller and smaller. An average data set, to give you an idea at the moment, is 15,000 records. That's the average size. While in the beginning, the in the first years of OBIS, in the data sets were 1 million records. So we, we picked low-hanging fruits, uh, but it, I mean, to keep the, that pace, uh, we are adding all small pieces of the puzzle. Um, the majority fi is fish, 50% of all the records are fish records, but uh, of course you all know that the phylog phylogenetic uh, diversity in the ocean is much higher than on land, so here you see an, uh, an overview of all the taxono major taxonomic groups. So, and within the economic exclusive zones, the EZs, we, since 1990, we have about 1 million observations in OBIS, and in, a in ABNG, in areas beyond national jurisdiction, or the high seas, we have about 200,000 records. Even the open ocean is 50% of the, of the planet, so we don't have a lot of information from that part of the world. In terms of sampling effort for depth volume, so if you, if you squeeze the ocean into a 2D dimension, so every square re actually represents a volume uh, in the ocean, you can see that the majority of the records is from the surface and from the continental shelf. So it actually means that for 99% for of the ocean volume, we actually have less than 100 sampling events, less than 700 records, and less than, seven, less than 13 species per 10,000 cube kilometers. So if you want to compare that with what we have 
from the continental shelf. There, for the same volume, you have more than 13,000 sampling events, more than 250,000 records, and more than 2,000 species. So really, for 99% of the ocean, we know very, very little. But this, it's a work in progress. Here I, I present you a graph of uh, the decades. So at the, the x-axis, you, you see decades from 1900 up to 2010. And you have the latitude uh, zero, the, the equator. So really, global monitoring started in the 1950s. And, and progressively increased in the southern hemisphere. In the Arctic, uh, strangely, it goes up and down. Uh, same type of graph, but then from then showing the number of records by distance from the nearest coastline. There you really see that there's a cut off. Uh, two two thousand kilometers is uh, very far away, so it's also very difficult to get uh, records uh, uh, from those most remote places. In terms of that, we, so we are sampling more and more, and we go deeper and deeper in the, in the ocean, um, except for the very uh, deepest places in the ocean. So it's really, I mean, most of, beyond 5,000 meters, uh, we have very, very little records. And it's actually decreasing that number. One of our projects is uh, DIPS, the Development of Information Products and Services to support ocean assessments, which is funded, uh, we got a grant from the Flemish government here in Belgium. So we hope to build some biodiversity indicators to support a number of ocean assessments, uh, which is one that just finished under the UN, is the World Ocean Assessment. There's one that will start uh, um, soon in I, with, with an IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. There is one, the Transboundary Water Assessment, funded by the Global Environment uh, uh, Facility. And the, there's also the Global Biodiversity Outlook uh, uh, Assessments, uh, publications published by the CBD, Convention on Biological Diversity. So there's lots of assessments going on. There's a lot, lots of need of information. The countries need to, there are a number of reporting obligations by countries. Uh, so that's something that we, we want to support the countries in. So if you think about indicators that we can produce, like the most obvious are, where are the biodiversity hotspots? Where are the most threatened species? Uh, where are the, the biggest gaps of our knowledge? Can we detect marine species extinctions? Uh, are the pop population size changes? Other a bit more difficult things, but very important, is are the changes in the community structure. Um, if you just look at number of records, then that's not a good indicator of how the species is doing. If you, for example, look here at the Fulmar species, in the 90s, we have, uh, it was the most recorded, most observed species in Obus. But then if you look at the relative abundance, so the, the number of records compared to other uh, bird species, it was actually decreasing, so it was actually losing its position within the seabird community. Other questions that we can uh, ask ourselves is, uh, because most of the species are rare, uh, let's try to look at the most common species and see if there are trends there. So what we did, so are the most common species always the most common? That's a question we can ask ourselves. So what we did is, and it's very difficult to see, but I will explain to you. So we have listed the most common, the 20 most common species per 10 taxonomic groups. and this is the per decade, and so this is the 1990s. So we give all the most common 20 species uh, the rainbow colors, and we compared of those species were also in the top 20 in the other decades. So from, from 2000 to the 80s, 70s, and the 60s. And then you can see, well, the top red has often remains the top red, and uh, maybe the, the purple blue at, at the bottom remains kind of purple-blue in the other decades, but there's a lot of gray. So gray means that the species was not in the top 20 in the 1990s. So there's a lot of drop out and drop in of, of species. So there are changes. So now it's the question is, are these true changes or is this just due to sampling bias? Is it just due to um, 
uh, sampling effort, uh, just the nature of the of the data in, in OBIS. Another uh, another uh, number of applications, uh, and I'll give you uh, a few examples of where data in OBIS has been used, is to avoid ship strikes with whales by predicting the density of cetaceans of marine mammals. So one of the examples is in the east coast of the US. They have uh, two decades of data, both airborne and, and ship-based, uh, of cetaceans. So it's a huge data set. They have uh, integrated that with oceanographic uh, data. They've done some analysis to predict absence and, and presence of, the, of those species. So they now have a clear tool which uh, provides the, the density of, of, of whales, fin whales, etc. Uh, in the coastline, and that's currently used to uh, inform the shipping industry that uh, that within one week or within two weeks there will be a very high density of fin whales because they all mi migrate and they all come together at certain times of the year when the circum circumstances are ideal. So they can actually move their shipping lines a bit further so that they can avoid the, the core density of the, of the fin whales. Another uh, application is here is we predict the viable habitat of theropods. The theropods are sea butterflies, uh, it's very small sea snails, but a very important food source for salmon or, or commercial fish, fish dogs. And, but they are also very vulnerable to ocean acidification, and we all know that the ocean is getting more and more acid. And so if you look at the CMAP5 uh, scenarios of the IPCC, then we, we can actually predict that the habitat of theropods is actually going to, to decrease, decrease very much. So everything is that threat is uh, theropods will not be able to survive. So only the blue and maybe the green areas are uh, are, are um, suitable habitat for those species. Global warming, and I don't know if you you may, you might have seen this uh, picture recently. This is the picture of uh, from NASA from October 2015. It was the hottest month on record globally, except for Iceland. I, I hear, and there is you can see the the blue area. The, the Iceland is very cold and much much snow at the moment. Uh, so we looked at the tropical species. Uh, in OBIS, so we, we took the 14 most common species for which we have lots of data before the 1990s and after the 1990s. So you can see the, the population uh, density abundance was really around the equator in the 1990s, before the 1990s. And if you look at the, the sample after the 1990s, you can actually see that the populations are splitting. And they're splitting by more than 500 kilometers away. Um, so that's a, already a clear sign that we can see from OBIS that uh, species are moving towards the poles and uh, it's because it's just getting too hot for them. Uh, I already said that one of the mandates, one of the purposes of OBIS is to support uh, conservation and uh, by establishing pr protected marine areas. So there are a number of uh, international bodies that are assigning special areas. Uh, the International Seabed Authority, for example, is establishing the areas of particular environmental interest, the APIs. Probably the most uh, known areas are the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Also, FEO uh, is uh, setting up the vulnerable marine ecosystem areas. Uh, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, has their own areas called particularly sensitive sea areas. And the CBD, the Conventional Biological Diversity, have the APSAs, the ecologically or biologically significant areas. And as, uh, I'll give an example, uh, because, because we were asked by the Conference of the Parties of the CBD to support the at APSA process. So they are organizing a number of regional workshops. Uh, so by inviting the experts of the region uh, to, to define what are the most uh, ecologically, biologically uh, important areas. And one of the one of the main sources of information is OBIS. And here is an example where one of the EPSAs uh, clearly matched the, the diversity uh, data from OBIS. So this is what it is at the moment. The countries, uh, so it's, it's, it's a long process. I think in a few weeks they have 
one more workshop in, for uh, South Asia and China. Um, I think 75% of the, of the ocean is covered at the moment by this process. So these are the, the areas that are, uh, I think, all approved at the moment by the countries. So as I said, we, we, we try to support a number of international processes. I already mentioned the four uh, ocean assessments. I have men mentioned the, the EPSA uh, process by the CBD. But you also have the regional fisheries bodies, so a lot of the OBUS nodes have very good interactions with those fisheries uh, uh, bodies uh, as part of FEO. We also try uh, the process of assembling an agreement uh, of cooperation with the International Seabed Authority to build a deep sea um, a portal, because they are the ones who provide licenses for deep sea mining. And, but to do deep sea mining, you need to know exactly what the impact is of deep sea mining on the local biodiversity. So they need uh, data on biodiversity for that. And there is an important process at the moment uh, in New York uh, under the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea, uh, UNCLOS. Uh, they are ne negotiating a new uh, legally binding instrument or implementing agreement to conserve and sustainably use biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction in the high seas. It's called the BBNJ. So there, uh, it's very likely that uh, both UNEP, FEO, uh, Interceptive Authority, and uh, maybe also IOC with OBIS will have a key role in uh, the, that uh, uh, new agreement. Then, um, two processes to, uh, to try to uh, establish, um, provide guidelines on what we need to measure and, and how we should accord and organize ourselves is part of GeoBon and GOOS. Uh, GeoBon, uh, the Biodiversity Observation Network of GEO, the global, er, uh, global earth uh, group on earth observations, sorry. So they are in the process of uh, identifying EBVs, essential biodiversity variables, and establishing MBONs, marine biodiversity observation networks. And they're also building a toolbox, BON in a box, how you set up a, a marine biodiversity uh, network. So um, at the moment, I think they will launch, or they just have launched one uh, the toolbox in Latin America, which is uh, done very much in combination with NVMR and Colombia. Then uh, Goose. So we have recently established a new panel in Goose, the Biology and Ecosystems panel of the Global Ocean Observing System. So we had, Goose was very much, very strong in physics and climate, already for uh, more than 10 years. So some years ago, they established the biogeochemistry panel, and now they established a, a biology and ecosystems panel. And there we are identifying the most important uh, ecological EOVs, the essential ocean variables, um, and try and try to expand the, use the existing uh, observing systems and make them, um, uh, uh, make them so strong that they apply to the criteria of goose, which means that they really serve the societal needs. That's an important. It's not just we don't want to just measure everything, uh, and not just for the sake of knowing. We really want to do measurements that can have applications, that can have improvements in management, that can so, can benefit society. That's important for goose. And then building indicators, we work, uh, and that's also an important. Uh, new initiative, Future Earth, uh, that will that sees itself as bridging science with policy, to, uh, so that will have a role within IPBES, for example, to provide science uh, layer to the intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Of course, Opus we do training. Uh, we had two training courses last year, one for particularly for Africa and one for the Opus nodes. And we have another one uh, this week uh, with participants from all over the world. And this is my last slide. If you're active on social media, you can follow us, uh, for example, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook. And presentations, I post them on SlideShare.